Hello, everyone. I'm Maureen Lowe, founder, president, and editor-in-chief of Financial Technologies Forum and FTF News. Welcome to today's webinar, Digital Transformation and Asset Management, What Does It Take to Win?, produced by FTF and sponsored by Sapient. According to research and advisory firm IDC, spending on digital transformation is expected to increase to more than $2.1 trillion in 2019, affirming digital transformation is a key investment area regardless of industry. In this time of rapid change, understanding the combination of drivers for successful transformation is critical. In this webinar, we will examine winning strategies for asset managers across the entire spectrum from customer experience and engagement. During the hour, we will discuss whether asset managers are making the right investments in digital transformation, how effective are these investments, what impacts they have created, and most importantly, what it takes to win. Before we get started um, on today's presentations, I just want to go over a few administrative details, starting with CPE credits. Eligible participants can receive one CPE credit for still listening to today's webinar. In order to receive the credit, you must stay on for the entire duration of the presentation and participate in all three polling questions we ask during the 60-minute period, starting with the one on your screen now. So if you haven't done so already, please take a moment to indicate if you would like to be considered for CPE credits. We also ask that you only request them if you're required to do so by the NASBA. So if you're asking right now who is the NASBA, you probably don't need them. And also to note, CPE credits are available only to those listening to the live events and not to the recorded version of the webinar. And while we're waiting for some last minute people to come on, um, I just want to talk a little bit about your event console and how you can use it. You'll see that there's a Q&A window open to the left of your slides where you can submit questions at any time throughout the webinar. And we do advise that you take the opportunity today to ask questions of our experts. We'll be addressing questions from the audience during the last 10 minutes or so of this webinar. And just so everybody knows, they are confidential to the presenters and not seen by the other attendees. If you are listening to the on-demand or recorded version of this webinar, you can still submit questions that will be emailed to us and answered accordingly. A PDF of today's presentation is available for download in the resources section of your console. And lastly, if you are active on Twitter, you can tweet directly from this console by clicking, clicking and opening the blue Twitter widget at the bottom of your screen. With that, I am pleased to announce today's presenters. Uh, thanks, Maureen. Um, hi, I'm David Poole. On behalf of uh, Jala and myself and Sapient, I'd like to thank FTF for making this webinar possible. I lead Sapient Razorfish's Financial Services Center of Excellence, guiding asset managers around the world on their digital transformation through thought leadership and customer insight. Uh, you'll hear I have a, a British accent. I'm actually based in Boston and work with clients around the world. You'll also hear an Irish accent from my uh, fellow Boston colleague, Jarlath. Thanks, David. Hello, I'm Charlotte Ford. I'm also with Sapient in our consulting group. Um, I focus exclusively on asset management clients, and I own what we call our Client Connect solution, which helps asset managers optimize and digitally transform their marketing and client service operations. So uh, more than one-third of Sapient's business is in financial services with over 100 asset management clients. Uh, we work across the entire life cycle of asset management from the front, middle, to back office, uh, to marketing and client service, service. As a digital transformation partner with over 25 years experience, we consult on and define strategies, but we also implement complex data-driven technologies so we know what works with an approach anchored in a radically customer-centric philosophy. Yeah, as David said, we're very outcome-driven for our clients, and so some of the noteworthy topics we've been working on with clients, implementing and integrating the cloud and DevOps, um, applying advanced database technologies and data governance using our Sapient Synapse tool. Um, artificial intelligence has been an, an interesting recent focus area, including things like predictive analytics on the marketing and sales side, natural language recognition, and natural language generation. So why are asset managers digitally transforming? There's no single reason for this change. 
These are all things you are probably familiar with. You've seen the outflows into passively managed funds. We've been through a period of sluggish returns that have put fee pressure and a focus on cost containment. Um, we've had this moving target around regulation even as recently as this week with the Department of Labor rule. Yeah, add to that the rapid change in customer expectations of real-time service, access, and transparency. Uh, the growth in non-traditional client segments like $30 trillion wealth transfer to millennials that's impending, the acceleration in digital adoption, and the, that refreshingly simple, low-cost digital-first experience offered by fintechs. There's an imperative for digital transformation to deliver uh, what at Safety we call the three Cs, competitive advantage, cost reduction, and compliance. But there are some pretty significant challenges to implementing this transformation. The top two being excessive data complexity and inadequate IT infrastructure. And this is the, the first um, of a number of data points drawn from a survey that Sapien conducted with the Knowledge Group at Fortune in order to better understand our clients. So we surveyed 51 asset, manage, asset managers, uh, senior execs, uh, in the U.S. in the third quarter of 2016 and benchmarked those results against nine other industries. And the most urgent priority in these transformations is risk management. Not surprising given the transparency pressures from regula regulators. Um, in fact, one of the things that was interesting to us and which we saw from the survey was that asset managers are ahead of other industries when it comes to the digital transformation of core infrastructure, of the investment product manufacturing, uh, which is not surprising given the data-driven nature of the industry. But while asset managers are prioritizing that core service, and you see here risk management, trading, execution at the top, the digital transformation of the customer engagement is lagging, particularly in contrast to everyday experiences uh, with consumer brands. So this is a build it and they will come fallacy. Uh, the digital spend is on the infrastructure to build these products, the fund manufacturing, not on how to get funds into customers' hands, the fund marketing and distribution. And we talked earlier about you know, competition, you know, co competition, cost, and compliance, competition as a driver. And what stood out to us from the survey was compared to other industries, asset managers are far more concerned about competition. And that's not surprising when you follow the news. Just last month, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, you may have seen it, uh, that talked about how 54% of flows into mutual funds and ETFs in 2016 went to one firm, uh, to Vanguard. And they've done a fantastic job. It's taken them over $4 trillion in assets under management. So you've got to throw out the rule book. Uh, today, competition was determined by performance, yet the best capital raisers raise four times more capital than the best investment performers. Uh, Vanguard's really changed the game to compete on low expense ratios. You see here on this, uh, this banner ad, we run our fund at cost, so you keep more of what you earn. Uh, that differentiation in, in the brand based on a very simple value prop uh, and then ensuring accessibility to funds in every channel for every segment uh, was, uh, we feel, key to, uh, to that, uh, that boost. A sure way to be the largest fund was to be the first mover. But actually, when you look across these nine newer fund categories, the first five entrants have a small share, and the largest funds are dominated by, you see here, the 60th entrant or the 81st entrant. So one more reason to throw out that rule book. You're not competing on performance or fund innovation. This is about brand and experience. Now, we're going to do our second poll. Um, we're interested to know where you are in your digital transformation. Yes, thank you, David. That brings us to poll question number two. Which of the following statements best describes your organization's current approach to digital transformation? Um, please just select one answer. Um, and just as a reminder to those that need CPE credits, you do need to participate in this poll, but we do invite everybody. Um, so please select from the below. We are already a fully digital enterprise and continue to invest to strengthen this position. 
We have implemented a significant number of digital initiatives in the past five years and are now combining these initiatives. We have implemented a significant number of digital initiatives in the past five years, but these initiatives remain siloed. We have sig defined a significant number of digital initiatives and we plan to implement in the next five years. We have implemented or plan to implement a large, a limited number of digital initiatives. And finally, we have not implemented nor do we plan any digital initiatives. And just why we give people a couple more minutes to respond. Um, I know there are a lot of you out there, so we, we do invite you to participate in the polling questions. We, we will share the results with you. Um, and if there's anybody listening today that feels a colleague might benefit from this webinar, it will be archived um, for the next 12 months. So um, they are also welcome to register. So I think, I think the submissions are slowing down. We'll give everybody a couple more seconds please do participate. It's very interesting information. Okay. I think we are ready to close out the poll. Okay. Well, thanks, Maureen. That's, that's very interesting to see that uh, folks are, are relatively early on this progression. So we're seeing um, a limited number of digital initiatives, E, uh, they've been defined but, and planned to roll out the next five years. Um, so actually a little, uh, a little further back than, than the, uh, the survey we feel with Fortune. Any, any observations uh, from your end, Jala? Yeah, I think just the other thing there too is uh, you know, a lot of responses to, to B as well. So people you know, have started these mm -hmm. initiatives and now seem to be connecting the dots um, between the initiatives. Mm -hmm. and that's, that is very consistent with, with where we see folks with some of these transformation initiatives that they start as individual projects but start to get folded into a larger program of transformation um, so that you can really start to yield some of the benefits. Absolutely. And in fact, that's, that's in line with uh, this, this other data point we see. Um, so asset managers really take, starting to take steps to, to address this gap in digital, and uh, the first four of these uh, items are ahead of other industries. So whether that's appointing a chief digital officer or building multidisciplinary uh, digital product development teams and so forth, um, there's, uh, there's clearly some traction. So in this next section, David and I are going to take you through um, some examples of um, what that digital transformation looks like for different firms. It comes in a lot of different flavors. It sounds like from the poll that, that we kind of have a little bit of a split here where um, some folks have initiatives defined, some folks have made some progress and are looking to combine. Um, I think you'll see some of that echoed in what we're going to take you through. Um, but hopefully there are some things in here too that will, you can take away and really think about how those ideas might get applied into your own firm. So as, as David said earlier, even though asset managers are, are, are very concerned about competition more so than other industries, increasing operational efficiency just squeaked ahead in the survey uh, of competition as the top factor central to the transformation efforts. Um, it's an interesting um, tension there between investing in competitive capabilities and cost savings from an operational um, efficiency perspective. One of the things that we see is that this tension is felt really acutely within marketing across the, the industry. Marketing feel like they do not do campaigns. They do sales enablement. They're doing a lot of the blocking and tackling. Um, so they're looking to digitally transform their marketing operations so that they can operate more efficiently and create the space and open up the resourcing to compete more effectively. Can I add to that, Joel, that um, really that, that operational efficiency is a means to an end to free up funds to, to compete, and it's competition that should be the North Star, that competitive edge. Um, and I think to, to earn the, the, 
the funding within the asset management manager, the, uh, the marketing really has to drive value, be more accountable, and that's going to be critical. So operational efficiency, automation of reporting, marketing, sales collateral, outsourcing of non-differentiated capabilities like managing web content and other cost savings can really help free up that budget um, and free up those people resources for that digital investment into competitive differentiation. We've been working with firms to identify opportunities to redeploy budget away from operational activities through efficiency gains and automation and reapply that budget into transformation efforts. From the earlier survey response, we saw that data complexity was a number one obstacle for transformation. And that data complexity runs all the way through the business, from idea generation all the way through to the marketing and servicing of the clients. And it's an obstacle to transformation. The data is coming from so many sources. And we see clients with having an imperative to standardize so that all these touch points from a customer perspective become consistent and really seamless and consistent expressions of your differentiation and of your brand. Firms are kickstarting these transformation activities by digitally transforming operational efficiency all the way through the organization. And We're helping clients cut through that complexity. Our Sapien Synapse tool helps our clients map out all these data connection points so that they can really focus on the customer experience and really focus on being digitally driven. Having content and data standardized and pre-approved by compliance means that you have more agility in integrating it into your client and, pers and, and prospect experiences. It's allowing our, our clients to become digital first and digitally driven. And when we look at the ecosystem, this is where I want to echo back to the poll responses where I think we had uh, our second sort of largest response rate was around integrating some of these digital initiatives. What we've seen is clients focusing on some of these buckets individually. So whether it's digital marketing, where a lot of the more retail-oriented firms were the first movers, into client intelligence, which has become a big focus area, um, integrating CRM and client data and client activity into a single view of the client, um, content and data and document management from an efficiency and an automation perspective, and client reporting and servicing, again, from an automation and efficiency perspective. So some firms are working on these buckets individually, and other firms are now working to really start to integrate these different pieces of their digital ecosystem. And for retail, it's historically been about scale, about enabling the organization to reach out to a lot of people. And so that's been a big driver behind that earlier adoption of some of this, these digital capabilities. For firms that are more institutional and institutionally focused, there hasn't been that same understanding or adoption of the value of digital. Um, it's, it's all about a one-on-one -on -one relationship that's very people-driven. So there is still, though, a tremendous opportunity for digital to augment these relationships and to make these relationships and sales teams much more efficient in driving those depth conversations. So um, in addition to the, that efficiency um, benefit, 
and uh, sort of cost reduction. Um, I'm going to look at a few examples that really focus on giving uh, asset managers a competitive edge. Um, so the first one here is thinking uh, about what the customer need is uh, in, in the context of content and choice and formats. And videos are useful in selecting the right product. Uh, videos are central to our redesign of Schroders.com from this 60-second highlight, uh, that sort of quick facts to uh, deeper dives, really reflecting the range of depth needed by different users. The second data point here, 91% of financial advisors share online content with their clients. Advisors are often connected with their clients on social media and use social to prospect and grow relationships. So catering to that with shareable content is, is very valuable. Um, you can see the little share link here on, on, the, on the screen. Um, and keeping a strong social presence, it's, uh, certainly it's a challenge in a risk-averse corporate culture like, like we see in asset management, but it's a challenge worth overcoming. Next example is the uh, expect... Oh, go ahead, Jonas. I was going to say, David, for, for smaller firms, that's a real competitive opportunity where they can take advantage of a medium like social, which is lower cost, to really get their differentiation out there and be able to speak to an audience um, that they may not have the resources to go talk to in person. Absolutely. Um, second example, expectation of relevance. So we've got 49% 40, of advisors expecting personalized content. Um, so that was a, a driver in, in our work for, for Barclays, where advisors can gather relevant research and receive recommendations even before they log in. So often the unauthenticated experience is one size fits all. Uh, so it's important to consider that as well. Uh, third example here, uh, using characters to tell a story. So Advisors are inundated with funds that are often feel interchangeable. Uh, the portfolio managers themselves, those strategists, are often behind the scenes. In our work with Allianz Global Investors, um, we heroed those managers and made them more accessible. Now you can see the, the LinkedIn link here next to uh, Stefan Hofrichter. Um, that's an opportunity to engage with them. And uh, in our interviews with advisors, that access to the portfolio manager and understanding their thought process was a priority. Uh, so it takes the faceless funds and uses characters to tell a more differentiated story. Next example, and really this is the sort of the fundamental, is ease of use. So 65% of advisors feel the quality of the online experience directly impacts the amount of time they're going to spend using the product. Um, so with that in mind, uh, you see the, what we did here with Allianz and Fasted Search uh, on the fun page to help you quickly uh, drill down from the 1,526 funds to the ones that are relevant in the moment. And then the fund page itself that you get to, while performance uh, is not the competitive differentiator, performance data is still critical, um, the number one thing that uh, advisors are looking for, and uh, giving the fast lane option to that retail advisor to give them the quick facts, and then the option to really drill down and the exhaustive depth for that institutional audience or the research analyst, is, is that flexibility is really critical. So now on to our third poll. Uh, we're interested in knowing how has digital transformation creative value in your company? Yes, thank you, David. Polling question number three. Um, in which of the following ways has digital transformation created value for your company today? And unlike the other one, please select more than one answer if you feel that a number of them pertain to you, so you can click all that apply. Um, improved our products and or services. Improved the experience we offer to customers. Improved how the organization handles data and analytics. Improved how employees collaborate internally and with partners. Achieved significant cost savings. Improved revenue from existing streams. Opened up new revenue streams, markets, industries. Become more in innovative. Or uh, finally, none of the above. So just as a reminder, you can click all of the options that seem to apply to you. 
and we'll give everybody a couple more seconds to answer. If you did indicate you wanted to receive polling questions, you are required to participate in this particular poll, but we do hope that everybody who's on the call today participates, and we will be sharing these results with you as well, like the last poll. And also, for anybody that might have come on a little bit later, just want to remind everyone that you can download the PDF of the presentation from your event console. Let's give everybody a couple more seconds. It looks like the responses are slowing down. Come on, anybody, last minute before we close out. Okay. Okay. So what we're seeing here is, unsurprisingly, given how data complexity was one of the biggest obstacles, um, the uh, improving how the organization handles data analytics is, uh, is in the lead and uh, improving the experience, uh, number two. So um, really critical benefits of, of digital transformation. Uh, Charles, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's interesting to see H become more innovative is also there. So I think you know, the, the, sort of the, the, the perception of asset management industry not being innovative I think is clearly changing and there's clearly a desire um, as people grapple with <clears throat> the data and the analytics and get some of that organized and standardized and more accessible and more available to the organization, it's letting them start to think about how to create these better experiences for prospects and customers and think about ways to really innovate, whether it's innovating on the product side um, and or innovating on the experience side. Indeed. So um, we've covered why transform and what that can look like now as promised in the title of the webinar, How to Win. Uh, winners embrace radical customer centricity. So most start on the right of this chart, inside out, uh, with operations. Uh, Customer-centric asset managers start with the customer need on the left of this chart. So mapping the journey, designing the experience to meet those needs with technology and process more enabling that experience. So we're going to cover our five-fold formula for success, um, first of which is understanding the needs of customers. And that's um, the shift from customer focus, uh, which is doing more of what you do today with some consideration of the customer, to customer-centric, which really turns that on its head. And that's, and that's really Next important, David, I think. Yeah, I'm sorry, David. That, that, that you go ahead. There's no asset manager out there who will n not say that they're customer focused, and it's a subtle change to be customer centric. It's really talking about and positioning your products in the context of the customer need um, and the customer's pain point, um, and that's really important. And it's it's how you start to gather information and really understand where your your offering fits in and how it really starts to address a need that your customer has. And differentiate brand, number two. So if most brands are leading with performance or innovation, as we saw Vanguard's low fees message stood out, but that's just one story. So what value proposition is authentic to your organization and will resonate and be differentiated with your target? And third, identify customer types and define their journeys. So the one-size-fits-all approach is out. Asset managers are typically engaging a wide range of customers with different journeys, longer and shorter sales cycles from you know, retail to institutional. And so defining those journeys and aligning valuable capabilities around those journeys is, is really key to success, like that short video that we mentioned that maybe the advisor can access on a smartphone before uh, going into a meeting. And the last one of those um, is transforming and optimizing marketing operations. So I want to touch on that. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we've talked a little bit earlier about how there's this tension between working in a cost-constrained environment and finding ways to invest in new capabilities. So transforming and optimizing marketing operations is a way for firms to do two things. One is, is save that cost and free up those resources, but also then 
align data and deal with some of that data complexity um, so that it is available to be really wrapped into these differentiated stories um, and, 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 and used in the context of a customer journey and in ways that are relevant to um, the end customer. So to recap, this is the fivefold formula for successful digital transformations founded on radical customer centricity. Asset managers are digitally transforming to better compete and reduce costs, and we shared what that can look like and how to succeed. And uh, now we're excited to hear your questions. Yes, thank you, Jarlath and David. Uh, we are now going to move to the question portion of the webinar. So if you haven't done so already, please submit your questions at this time. Um, if we don't have enough time to get to all the questions before the end, um, they will be addressed by the presenters following the close of today's webinar. And while we're waiting for some additional questions to be submitted, I'll just note that as a reminder, um, you or any of your colleagues can access this webinar on demand for the next 12 months. Uh, the recorded and archived version will be available within 24 hours um, of today's call, and you will receive an email notification when it's available, and you can also check back to the FTF site. Um, so it looks like we have some questions starting to come in. So I'll start with the first one. How are firms maximizing the investments they have made in digital capabilities? Yeah, thanks. So you know, I think we saw this in the poll um, a little earlier where firms were starting to look at integrating some of these, these opportunities. So that's one of the ways that firms are now starting to um, look at transformation, trying to programmatically um, approach transformation and not just individual projects, really start to tie them together. So that's one of the ways. The second way is that firms are really starting to look at the capabilities that they have invested in and understand whether they are fully optimizing and leveraging those capabilities. Um, there are many tools and capabilities that exist within the organization where the full potential of those tools is not being leveraged. Um, and that's really a big focus for a lot of firms is figuring out how do they make the, take the most advantage of the things that they have um, and make sure that they're integrating them into all of the other pieces um, that they're working with. And then the last piece is um, really looking at the outcomes they're trying to drive and aligning those programs and initiatives around those outcomes um, rather than being focused on capability. I think we've seen a wave of you know, adding capability, and I think now the, sort of the, the, the shift is going from adding those capabilities to really leveraging those capabilities to delivering outcomes. Okay, great. David, Next question. Oh. Nope. Ready for the next question? Yes. How, how do I create the business case to invest in transformation in an environment where budgets are constrained? Well, that's a great question. Um, so as we saw with that, that quote from the, the CMO, um, Oftentimes, marketing is, is not getting the budget they need, and I think part of the challenge is oftentimes it, it's not being held accountable for, for delivering ROI. Uh, and when, when there are limited uh, budgets uh, for investing in digital transformation, uh, I think the key is taking what you have, proving, uh, proving value with that, and building the case for further investment. It doesn't have to be a big bang approach um, where you, the, you know, the budget is outsized to, to the appetite within the firm. Jonas, what anything you'd add? Um, no, I, I think I think you covered it pretty well, David. Okay, next question. This is a long one, and I'm reading in a tiny window, so bear with me. If and when appropriate, this participant would like um, you to address the following. One, could you elaborate on where in asset management organizations digital initiatives are gaining momentum? Are these initiatives IT-driven or business-driven? 
and who typically owns or manages a digital product development team in an asset management organization? There's a second part to that question, but I'll do that one after I do this one. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate on where in asset management digital initiatives are gaining momentum? Yep. Um, and are they IT-driven, business-driven? Okay. And then who typically owns, manages a digital product development team in an asset management organization? Um, I, I think what we've seen is that in sort of the first wave of digital transformation, this kind of echoes a little bit of what I said just a moment ago, um, that you had a lot of capability-oriented um, transformation happening where there was new capabilities being add, added. This is, has typically been IT-driven. Um, but I think what we're seeing now is that as the business is becoming more comfortable and more aware, frankly, of some of the capabilities, but also of some of the competitive challenges and seeing what some competitors are starting to do, that it is moving to being more business driven, whether business from a marketing and sales perspective on the distribution side, or business from a front office perspective from a product innovation um, side. Um, I think a lot of firms are looking through their business and understand, trying to understand you know, strategically where are they headed and what markets are they looking to play in and where is their future growth going to come from. Um, so I think that's also now starting to really weigh in on um, what's driving some of the digital initiatives um, and what's helping them gain momentum, um, more so than I think um, technology capabilities, though there still is a large reliance within most asset management firms on IT to provide perspective and inputs and to own the underlying capability strategy and make sure that the business is making appropriate investments and leveraging the investments that are already being made. Um, I hope that was responsive to the question. Um, we are seeing, um, again, I think we talked about earlier, firms, as for those firms that are starting to look at transformation more programmatically, more holistically, um, that they are starting to create change management slash transformation organizations, whether that means um, having a digital chief digital officer or whether that have, means having more digital product managers. Um, that is certainly happening um, within some organizations, and I, I, I do, we did see some responses around that in the survey as well, that firms had started to make some progress around creating and realigning internal resources um, around digital transformation and digital product management. Okay, there's a second part to that question. Are you ready? Yep. And to follow, are current solution implementations and asset managers typically being achieved through external vendors or professional services, or are they being built in-house? I think what we're seeing is a general move to the cloud. Now, there are exceptions within that. There are some firms that are not ready for that yet. But with the move to the cloud, you see you know, the people embracing software as a service more. Um, and I think that with, we talked about cost and, and, and cost being a big driver, um, that a lot of IT organizations are looking at their cost structure and saying which things are core that we should own and build ourselves um, and which things can be achieved using a vendor or a package um, and are non-differentiated and are going to help us manage and reduce our IT and technology costs over time. Um, so I think what we're seeing is a shift that is a little bit more weighted now towards using vendors and integrating vendor packages and capabilities rather than building in-house. Okay, great. Next question. Given that all asset managers aren't equal in size and scope, how do smaller advisory firms keep up with the technological developments of larger and more institutionalized providers? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, it's a good segue from Jala's point about the shift to, to SaaS solutions. Um, so the, you know, we've got obviously some deep pockets of you know, large, um, large asset managers. Um, and I think the way that the smaller asset managers, uh, of which there are many, many more, uh, can compete is uh, using size to their advantage. They can be uh, more nimble, 
uh, for us to market. They've got flatter organizations. Um, they can look at, at SaaS solutions, third-party solutions um, and that, that can be easily customized. Um, and also look at uh, what you can learn from fintechs, potentially partner with fintechs um, that can help give you that, that speed to market. Jonathan, anything you'd add? No, I think that's, that's great, Dave. Next question. Are firms outsourcing marketing and sales operations? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. We've seen that as a really as a trend that is starting to accelerate uh, very rapidly. Um, and again, I think it, it really ties back into um, not just the cost and the competitive piece, but really where do some of the marketing organizations want to apply their skill sets? Um, you know, that as a marketer. Um, you know, my opportunity to engage a customer is pretty limited when I'm just producing a fact sheet. So if I can outsource and offload the production of some of those baseline pieces, um, I can now really spend my time understanding the space that I'm competing in, understanding our positioning relative to our competitors and how that's changing, helping my sales teams reflect that, our differentiation around that positioning. Um, and then p use digital technology to push that out into the marketplace um, and test and validate that it's actually moving the needle um, and helping drive new leads, new assets into the business. Okay. Next question. Do you see a gap between desired and needed skill sets as far as digital transformation is concerned? So there's probably two sides to that, and, 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 and David, maybe you can kind of speak to marketing because I know that one of the things that we saw from the survey was that you know around core infrastructure, people, the asset managers feel that they're ahead relative to other industries, but that the client experience and the, the, the was piece was was lagging. Um, you know. I think one of the things that we're seeing within, from a digital transformation perspective, is that it's not just about individual projects and capabilities. Um, and so some of the skill sets that are really important are skill sets around transformation and change um, and being able to um, look at the impact on, on, on business processes and outcomes and, and align technology and capabilities and policies um, around that. Um, so it's not so, there are some elements of skill sets coming in, obviously from a technology, there are newer technologies, so they may come with skill sets that are needed. Um, and there is maybe new ways of thinking when you're working in more of a, an environment where you've integrated multiple SaaS providers, you're, you're really more focused on maintaining and thinking about how those pieces are integrated and not necessarily worrying about the infrastructure behind the scenes anymore. So there's a shift in maybe where you're focused. Um, the change management and, and the transformation skills, um, though, are, are probably one of the bigger gaps that firms have in terms of being able to really activate some of these transformation programs. Yeah, Jalas, I'd just add to that with um, Sort of ties back to the, the earlier data point around uh, advancements in sort of the core um, fund manufacturing and the skills needed to um, to to really transform that side of the business. And the, I think, relatively speaking, we see a gap in the kind of digital marketing, digital experience kind of skills that um, are really core to that competitive side of the equation. Uh, you know, a parallel, if you look at uh, banks um, acquiring design agencies and so forth, but I, think, I, think increase, I think that trend that we've seen in the last few years with uh, the likes of, say, Capital One acquiring Adaptive Path, which is a, a design agency, I think increasingly we're going to see asset managers considering some kind of um, 
opportunity to bring those skills in-house or to um, upskill the existing workforce or to, um, to partner with, with the right kinds of uh, digital agencies. And, and that, David, ties back to, I think, one of the earlier questions around the, the outsourcing, you know, which is if, if I have cost constraints and I have limited ability to hire and bring in new skills, do I want to bring in a skill that's highly differentiated and is going to really help us? You know, whether it's data science or predictive analytics, that's going to help us with targeting and personalizing our messaging. Um, or am I going to hire a web content manager, which is a really a non-differentiated capability or, or, or a document, document production person, which is really, you know, not, not going to help us move the needle from a transformation perspective? Okay, next question. How does digital advice robo fit into the digital transformation strategy of your asset manager clients? So robo-advisors typically, uh, we're looking at that as a component of this wealth management and the advisory channel as opposed to the asset manager wholesaler. Um, but I think that's, there's um, an opportunity to see some robo-advice-like tools augmenting those touch points between uh, the asset management sales teams and, and the intermediaries. Um, and further empowering the intermediaries to, to take a lot of the rather sort of simplistic aspects of uh, sort of portfolio allocation and balancing and, and automate some of those tasks. Yeah, you know, there was, there was some interesting data points. I, I was attended a conference yesterday um, for emerging asset managers, and some of the data points we talked to that it was another research firm had had done some surveys that that where they really hadn't gotten a, a very convincing answer from everybody around what role robo advice was going to play within their offerings. Um, you know, I think when you really look at the data, even though there's a lot of news around the products um, and some of the robo advisors and us in the industry are very aware of them. Um, when you actually go out and interview consumers, um, the brand awareness of somebody like a Wells Fargo, you know, is at 90 plus percent, right? The, the brand awareness of a Betterment or a Wealthfront is in is in the single digit percentages. Um, and so mm -hmm. there, you know, what, what we're seeing is really, as David said, is, is firms really figuring out how to bring Robo into their portfolio of offerings um, and how to position it. Um, and then, you know, obviously that as an asset manager, that can present challenges because now I not only have to go through, you know, the gatekeeper um, from a due diligence perspective to get on the platform, you know, it becomes yet another platform that I've got to be able to articulate my value proposition around and how I fit into that platform. Yeah, Jonathan, we've seen that in the recent years a number of acquisitions by asset managers of, of robos like uh, BlackRock, Future Advisor, and so forth, one of a number. Um, do, you, do you anticipate more of those? Yeah, I think we're going to see more of that. I think we're seeing firms really starting to build out some of those models themselves, too, um, and start to provide them. And so, um, you know, and I think there's, there's going to be a degree of consolidation in terms of, you know, that there will be a very similar to what we saw in um, banking with some of the, you know, the, the, the account aggregation platforms, um, that you're going mm -hmm. to see a little bit of consolidation down to a platform level there um, around some of the basic capabilities. Um, I think the, the other interesting data point that came out of the conference I was at yesterday was that um, a large percentage, um, greater than 60% of some of these younger investors um, have a higher tendency to actually want to get in-person advice, and I think this is actually now starting to run in, in, in against the sort of the tide of what sort of some of the prevailing understandings were that they wanted to be completely digital. And I think the, the hypothesis that was presented yesterday was that as as people get to the edge of their knowledge, so that that um, that. Robo advice can be a great entry mechanism for people into investing to really understand some of the options and to think about the long term implications of investing. But that once they start to use and embrace some of these tools, they very quickly start to get to the edge of their knowledge. 
um, and that once you reach the edge of that knowledge, you start to get into a point, a place where you're starting to make some emotional um, uh, decisions and you're starting to make some decisions that require trade-offs and that the need for advice um, very quickly starts to come into play and that's probably one of the biggest sort of shortcomings of the pure digital, pure robo um, capability right now is being able to sort of really tap into that the more emotional aspects and the more sort of trade-off aspects where it's not a black and white decision. It's understanding that if you do this, it has this implication um, and, and are you okay with that and that will be different for everybody. Mm-hmm. But Jalat, it's not binary. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, robot or human. I think we're increasingly going to see these sort of hybrids and it comes back to that um, one to one versus one on one tension, um, you know, from digital as a way to scale personalized experiences versus digital as a way to augment and deepen the sort of the one on one. And I think there's a, a role that digital device can play in both contexts. Okay, next question. Um, how do we compete with fintechs that are already digital and radically customer-centric? Mm. Uh, that, that, yeah, okay, that's sort of similar to this sort of robo-advisor discussion. Um, and I, I think that notion of competing or disruption um, coming from the fintechs is, is a little outmoded now. I think we're increasingly seeing conversations being more about a partnership. And... Fintechs in some way offer a sort of outsourced R&D where you can see what innovations work and, and which can fall flat and, um, and, and use these to, to your advantage. Yeah, and I think fin- fintechs too, too, David, I think you know, you, we had the slide earlier in the deck around you know, being first mover isn't always a guarantee of success in this industry. Um, and I think what's happening is you're seeing particularly the larger firms watching some of those fintech trends and then figuring out how to integrate and leverage them in their offerings um, and either you know, partnering, to David's point, or building out similar capabilities themselves um, to add them in. Um, you know, I think really the advantage, I think, as the question asked, is, is that the fintechs have is that they're digital from the beginning. Um, and so that's really the advantage that they have is they're not dealing with a lot of leg- legacy operational you know, procedures and policies and processes that take time to change and to shift within organizations. Um, and, and, and frankly, for, for a lot of them, they're also not dealing with a legacy um, client base. You know, if, if you as an asset manager started your life with separately managed accounts, and that now is a you know 10% of your business b- because you've moved on into selling pooled funds, um, and that's you know 80% of your 90% of your business now. You know it's likely that your cost structure is skewed the opposite way, and that you know 80% of your cost is probably associated with those separately managed accounts, and 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 20% with that pooled money. So you know, a, a, a fintech won't have some of those legacy challenges to deal with and think about in terms of, you know, how do we address this, this you know, our legacy business and how that's preventing us or pre- pre- presenting at least challenges to us in transforming. Okay, um, this goes back to something that was said earlier. You say not ready for cloud yet. This is mainly due to security issues. Given the state of cybersecurity, et cetera, mm. do you think adoption is naive and we, and we may mm. see a series of security-related issues as more and more asset managers move on to the cloud? Yeah, so this is a hot topic, and, and so the cloud-first strategy is a lot easier of a sell in a, you know, a media business or an e-commerce business, but when you're talking about uh, very you know high-value transactions, the stakes are a lot higher, uh, and I think there's a lot of apprehension about this. Um, also, cloud doesn't necessarily mean uh, you know cost savings, um, but the benefits of cloud first. Uh, the flexibility, the, the the speed to meet those expectations of, of real time um, access to data and and faster transactions, I think, uh, are very compelling. And and there's this misapprehension that not cloud is secure, um, but cloud's inherently encrypted. So I think there's there's a strong argument to be made. 
Um, Jonathan, what would you add? Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely two camps out there today. I think ultimately everybody's going to end up there. It's really a matter of how quickly and how how comfortable the organization is. There are some firms who have been on the cloud for a while, you know, doing risk modeling, doing sort of highly transactional um, types of activities where the cloud really provided, you know, cheap resources to do that. They've since moved on to providing, you know, using the cloud for storage and for applications. Um, and I think with SAP, more and more SaaS capabilities, what we're finding is that cloud is getting in under the radar um, and being embraced, whether it's you know by moving on to a you know a, a cloud-driven CRM platform or um, you know a cloud-driven uh, you know marketing platform. All of a sudden, once you start to break down that barrier, the, the firm starts to, to see an opportunity to move that way. Um, you know, encryption is definitely a challenge. We've seen some firms go to the cloud and really beef up the encryption, which can actually present challenges in itself because now you don't get, because of the encryption, it actually makes it more challenging sometimes to integrate some of these capabilities. Um, and so you lose some of the benefit of, of moving to the cloud. And then frankly, there are going to be some firms that are just going to stay very much off the cloud. Um, but I think a lot of that is really just more about their own philosophy. Uh, but for the ones who have, they've figured it out. They've figured out their comfort risk, their comfort level with security. Um, they've figured out um, and they've communicated to their clients their comfort risk, uh, comfort level with security because, you know, cloud and security has implications not just um, around, um, you know, IT and infrastructure, but also down into due diligence and, 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 the, client, and the client relationship. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. You guys have done such an excellent job so far. So last question for um, the presentation today. What is the most pressing unmet customer need? So Maureen, in, in our research with advisors, um, these, these folks are, are time strapped. They're inundated with, uh, with funds that um, are confusing, uh, rife with jargon, um, there's a lot to read through. I think if the, the unmet need is being the asset manager that is the easiest to do business with, gets, gets all of that friction out of the way so that uh, y you can help the advisor grow their business. Um, you know, if you can do that, I think that uh, all else being equal and performance and so forth, we've, we've really talked about sort of commoditization there. Um, you, you become the fund manager of choice uh, for, for that advisor to, to place um, with their clients. Yeah, I, I, think that's, I think David's right on is, is really knowing that, again, it goes back to this idea of client centricity, right, is really knowing what your client's needs are, what their priorities are, being efficient with their time, really being able to communicate your differentiation, how it fits into their offering, what they're offering to their clients. Um, and, and making sure that you can really continue to sort of answer questions. So whether you're overperforming or underperforming, you know, being able to quickly help them understand why this is still the right strategy and still aligned with what you know their internal needs are, um, I think is really important. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Darlith and David, and thank you to all the participants on today's call. Um, again, we hope you check out the recorded version. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.